everybody. Welcome back to Mile High Podcast, episode 52. Today we're talking about the lost civilization of Atlantis. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so before we get started, though, I just wanted to apologize for um, the lack of uploading last week. Um, I had a, oh my gosh, I've had the craziest two weeks. We it were really like, has been. Yeah, we were in LA for a project for a video that will go live on my channel next week or this coming week. And um, the night I was there, my grandpa had this huge stroke and I didn't even think he was gonna make it after that because it was really, really bad. Um, but he has been kind of like bouncing back and then declining and then bouncing back. And so basically I've been at the hospital a lot dealing with that. Um, he was on life support. They took him off life support now, so he's doing better now. He's breathing on his own. They put a feeding tube in today. But, um, yeah, I just wanted to explain to you guys um, yeah, why I, mean, I haven't been uploading, too. And I won't be uploading for a while. I'm going to take a break just to be with my family. And right, for those take of you that for mental health. watch your channel, right? And then, obviously, we didn't have an episode last week because, right. because of this as well. So. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Um, but... There will be podcasts in February, even though I'm going to take a break from my channel. Yeah, exactly. We're not stopping the cast. We've got yeah some more coming. I just need you, you know, family first. You never know, like, when you're going to have your last well, you time know, yeah, with someone. Exactly. It's just a good reminder, you guys. Like, oh, my gosh, you really never know. I was I Yeah, was and family's shook. everything at the end of the day. Like, nothing else yeah. matters but your family. You know, True. no career, job, money. There's yeah. nothing that can mm -hmm. replace the time you have with your loved ones. So Yeah, and just... You know, I'm local, you so being available is important. And um, so, yeah. But yeah, thank you guys for all the, the love, support and, you know, thoughts and prayers and vibes and everything else. Like I, he's gotten, you know, we've seen some improvement. So yeah, we really things hope are, he'll be moving out of the ICU soon, hopefully. I mean, he's off a of ventilator, so that's really that's big. That's the biggest thing. Yeah. Big thing. Huge I mean, thing. And when he's we still took alive, him off so. of it, we weren't sure if he would make it. It was so scary. But it we've is. had a crazy experience with it. Josh came with us to... um Oh, have God. a serious talk we had when we put him on life support that was a major decision um and we talked about you know end of life care how you can do either curative care or comfort care which is basically help like letting someone die with dignity it's basically transitioning pain. to hospice eventually yeah like, it's the right. end so we had to talk you. about that and josh was in the room and the doctors i must say were just horrible like just awful. They were <laughs> not impressive. disrespectful to my family. Um, they yelled at us for interrupting at one point and um, just pretty standoff, just impatient and cold. They said, Yeah, there was like, he was like, He'll never be grandpa again. There's a 5% chance he'll even wake up. Basically, and like you and your family were asking the doctor, looking for some glimmer of hope. Yeah. And something to hold on to. And doctors obviously have to be realistic about things. But just the way, the fact that you showed no, not even an ounce of care really on, you know, on a, a perspective sucked. And yeah, it was disappointing. Just, you know, how some doctors are. They're kind of know it all. Some of them, obviously yeah. not all, but well, a lot of them. <laughs> it just seems like it. I mean, it seems I've had like a, a lot. Just tough run with doctors myself. So try to talk over your head or act like you can't possibly understand anything medically. Like, right. Mm -hmm. and, and and I mean it's nice to get doctors who respect you if you do do your research, you know So yeah. we've had mm -hmm. different experiences like we have a really great yeah, endocrinologist a now So yep, that's a good who actually good thing. yeah Gave us a little bit of hope in the American healthcare system <laughs> <laughs> But um anyway enough personal stuff So yeah guys, we're gonna be talking about Atlantis. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited whether for or not it existed about Atlantis and we're gonna tackle that question because was it a myth or was it a actual place just forgotten and lost into ancient history? So, mm. so many interesting things about that. But the first thing or first story I wanted to bring up today is about Casey Hathaway. And this was like, since we missed her uh, podcast last week, this was supposed to be last week's, but, but the mm. week before uh, this three-year-old boy went missing in North Carolina, just like was at his grandma's house and then like wandered into the woods mm -hmm. And he was playing outside in the yard with two other children when he was discovered missing and he was nowhere to be found. And so, I mean, this is in North Carolina in a rural wooded area. So this is, you know, kind of back country a bit. So scary. All kinds of things out there that a little three-year-old boy, you know, 
may not fend well against. So he was out there though for um, hours and hours and hours and it was raining and they ended up finding him a few days ago if you didn't hear about this. But he was, yeah, I mean, they did huge searches for him. The FBI got involved. They had 600 volunteers. Like they heavily searched for this kid and it was looking, I think, pretty grim. Like yeah. what are his chances of surviving like over two days mm -hmm. In nights You'd in think the wilderness, that it's like really grim chance. So the fact that officers finally heard a voice mm -hmm. coming from like a thorny, like bushy area, and there he was, soaking wet in Insane. in thorns, like huge thorns, just like scratched up a bit, but overall, like oh, my looked gosh. fine. That's insane. And nobody, everybody's perplexed at how he survived, and they asked the kid, like, how, like, what'd you do? Or you know, he's three years old, so obviously you can't. <laughs> communicate that well as to what you actually what happened to you but he told his aunt what which was interesting to me is that a bear came and stayed with him for two days that he was out there a bear and i mean obviously he's a kid he could have just made it up in his head or you know maybe mm. imaginary friend but he was like pretty certain about it and there are bears in this area so it's very it's possible that a bear could have came along. But. I think it's definitely possible. And I think animals have a natural instinct to know like when something is weak and young, like I think they can recognize a, a crying three year old that's creatures. alone right. versus an, a male that might attack them that they might want to attack back. Like they're not going to attack a weak, you know, Unless basically I mean, prey. Um, is it possible that they could? Yeah. But. Yeah, possible. But I feel like there would be, I think they're smart enough that some of them would see it as like a lost thing. Like, I think they sure. are smart enough to know that there's so many cases of animals in nature. There is. There taking actually Taking care of kids or, um, oh God, what was it? Like, it was a long time ago. I remember there was an amazing story about this kid who fell off of a boat and these dolphins just swam around him for like hours until people came and rescued him. It's like protecting him from sharks. It's just like I think animals do have that natural instinct to know when something needs their needs help. Or especially like can understand when something is young or like a yes. young of age. Yeah. And just of being weak. as young. Yeah. It's interesting because yeah. it makes you think about the possibilities of, well, if the kid wasn't just completely making up this bear that he saw or that protected him or was with him, then what could have happened and you go down the scenarios and the one that you just mentioned is very possible that a just a wild bear came along maybe it was a mama with her cubs or something and saw him just like crying and you know like if you ever think about your animals and cats and dogs like they can sense emotions oh, usually yeah and mine do yeah and they can when you cry how many times your animals come to you when you cry yeah. mm -hmm. so it's interesting that maybe on some level animals are able to really communicate with us or pick up are. signals from us that you know we're in distress and they mm -hmm. need our help mm -hmm. i think they can i think dogs can, can do it i mean how do we know how intelligent a bear a bear could be like a human intelligence for all and we i'm know. sure their intelligence varies it could have been a very smart bear yeah it could have. <laughs> i don't know i mean there and i'm sure there's other cases where bears literally attack you know kids and stuff and you know or kill uh human beings but at the end of the day i do think there's like that sense like a sixth sense that animals have that they can just kind of pick up on energies maybe or something. It's interesting. Maybe they're more in tune with that type of energy. Or another possibility is that the bear could have been like a, an angel of some sort or some or type of Bigfoot. That is out there, dude. That Hey, I was about to gotta, say, I bet people are, are we saying We got to keep an open mind guys. We do not Bigfoot know. Bigfoot was taking care of him. That was one of the theories actually. Maybe. I mean, the cat would probably, I mean the cat. <laughs> The kid would probably think it's a bear. But if you, you think a kid saw a Sasquatch, let's just say, <laughs> let's just say hypothetically. Okay. Wouldn't you think that three-year-old kid probably seen Star Wars and probably would think it was Chewbacca? Be like, Chewbacca he probably hasn't me. seen Star Wars. It's fucking 2019. He's three years old. The chances of him having seen Star Wars are honestly pretty low. <laughs> I don't know, dude. They got Unless like Star they, Wars Unless they like got him on now. that immediately. Like, okay, sit down, kid. You know, watch these old ass movies. No, but all the new stuff. There's the Star Wars Legos and there's it, all the kids he's stuff He's three now. though. I guess maybe. Maybe. I'm just saying it's possible. Okay. But... Well, I'm sure so it was just, just a fucking bear. So I just debunked Bigfoot theory. All right. That's debunked then. But no, I Probably just wanted just to talk. The spiritual aspect to it could be because like a lot of people oh, maybe who are religious oh. prayed for this kid and they believe that 
the bear was an angel or some type Definitely of protective entity that watched over him yeah. or just protected him. Yeah, and if you um don't know much about like angels in a non-Christian celestial sense, beings, yeah, right, celestial beings yeah. or angelic beings, right, um, of the angelic realm, um, they often are known, or I've from what I've read, they are supposed to ha be able to take hu um form of animals or other humans or an animate inanimate. <laughs> Inanimate objects. Inanimate objects. <laughs> Inanimate objects, yeah. Um, so it definitely could be like a spirit guide or a guardian angel because a lot of people believe that everyone has a spirit guide or a guardian angel or, or more than one sometimes. But, I mean, it's possible that child's spirit guide or guardian angel manifests itself into a bear and like How took cool care is that? of him. Yeah, I mean, crazier or things have happened. Or it's just a bear that is smart enough to know. I, I would wouldn't be sure he made by it that. up, but why would you know? I don't think he made it up. That's the last thing I believe, honestly. And I'm sure, like with therapy and stuff, if they do that, and yeah. you know, as he works through this traumatic experience, like I'm sure he'll one day be able to tell us definitively, like what yeah. it was. Like I'm sure yeah. he'll always remember that mm -hmm. that time he was lost in the woods for two days and nights. That's true. Like, he is a little traumatized. Maybe we should wait. So I don't know. I just thought that was a really interesting story, and, and and I mean, it's rare that you get like a happy story when it comes to missing people these days. Um, so it was good to see a kid come home that went out, you know, was lost and missing, and presume yeah. maybe, you know, in a dire situation. So very happy to hear about that. But the other thing that I wanted to talk about because it's starting to just pop up everywhere is DNA testing, and all these companies that are now DNA testing people. Um, or you're you're signing up to do it if any of you've ever done ancestry or 23 and me There's family tree DNA But what's interesting and is starting to happen is obviously with the Golden State Killer and other cases out there DNA evidence is is Being heavily used now and yeah. they're starting to go back and start pulling cold cases mm -hmm. and solving them because of DNA Yep, and there will be a lot more to come so there's this kind of big debate out there right now is you know should these dna companies that we give our dna to just give access full access to law enforcement to do whatever they want to do essentially and pull whoever's dna they want to pull and, and search records and all that sort of thing should we allow them to do that or should we you know is there an issue with I think our dna being I think it should be just the same as a warrant. Like you should have to get a warrant for case it. Case by like case you should basis, have to, yeah, right? You should um, have to show that there's enough of a, Proof, a decent yeah. idea that this person right. could have been involved in something. Because, um, yeah, when it comes to this kind of stuff, I don't think you should be able to hide that. Like police should be able to access it if it's going to solve a murder of like a you know little girl or something. Like April Tinsley. Was solved over the summer after 30 years. Well, that's the great thing about it because th this has like Good and bads on both sides really and the good thing about DNA and all of us submitting DNA is there they did a study that literally only 2% of the population has to give their DNA in, in order to test virtually everybody's information yeah, It's crazy. It's We're a like small amount to point. realize that you can go far back in people's family trees and eventually mm -hmm. trace back to whoever you want and that's that's crazy and obviously a great tool for law enforcement because they can just you know get their suspects DNA and Probably find out who it is relatively quick And maybe more cases will get solved. Maybe we'll be able to save More lives. I, I sure hope so. So I like that aspect of it, but the other aspect is You know giving our you know DNA to the government to these agencies is there a possibility that down the road they might try to Use that against us in some way or try to make us pay up for it or you know hold it hostage in a sense Like is there that possibility? I think the biggest concern is honestly the insurance companies doing that um, for, Again for like healthcare. Yeah, so that yeah I mean I mean that's a huge concern too because they can be like hey we have your DNA here and we can see that you're like susceptible to all this this and this you have these diseases in your family, you know, you're probably going to end up with this. So we're going to jack up your rates. That's what will happen. That's one possibility for sure. Yes. Or. I mean, right now there's just not enough legislature and laws that are going to regulate this thing. Cause this is so new, yeah. especially like all these new companies that are popping up. But 
yeah. these new companies are making millions and millions of dollars off of our genetic information. Yep. And they can sell it to who they want to. Exactly. They make the scary millions part. off of it. And that's it's like not even their business to do the kits really. That's like a very small part of what they're overall mission oh yeah it's the information they're getting right because think about it they're getting our future kids as well like their dna or i guess not i guess you wouldn't because it's like a new mix right how would that work like if like will they have our kids dna because we and yeah. I both did those tests yes but how would they know that we're are... mixed <laughs> what do they mix us up and then they get our kids dna i'm sure there's a way to figure it out i'm sure there's very well, oh yeah they can back they can trace track. it back to the parents i don't know if you can sure. trace it forward though that's what i'm wondering i know oh. you can backtrack lineage but i don't know if you can like determine yeah you wouldn't be able to because you wouldn't know who i would sleep with and get pregnant with you know yeah so you can't determine the dna so that's it okay <laughs> so we'll tell our kids not to fucking do this because we should have known better than to do it that was a mistake but at the same time it's like we're you know so many criminals are getting caught like yeah, but we also might get screwed on insurance. We didn't need to do it. They just said they only need 2% of the world to do it. <laughs> so I think I think either way it's going to happen. So basically don't worry about it. Just give yeah. them up. Give up your DNA. It's going to happen eventually. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's uh, that's essentially what we're saying. So, Well, I feel at least a little good that we did Ancestry because that one's supposed to be a little better than 23andMe. 23andMe is like the worst from what I've read. Yeah. They're the ones who just did the huge deal, like multi-million dollar deal. Selling a bunch of people's information. Well, and then they're gonna like give it to big pharma and stuff to yep. to keep yeah coming to up with stuff to yeah. And, which in a way could I mean, what if we solve cancer that way? There's goods and bads to this, just like technology or anything else um, developing. You know, like yeah, new things. There's just positives and negatives, pros and cons. What about cloning life. though? What if it pros goes and there? Cons. Cloning. What do you mean? I think that could. I think cloning is a very big possibility in happening. the future. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> likely is. Yeah. I know we're cloning animals, we're probably cloning yeah. humans too. I'm pretty sure. But like, what if, you know, down the road you're able to clone body parts of yourself and they can like grow them in labs and shit? That's so, that's weird. But I think if it helps people, you know. Like what if, you know, if you've lost a limb, yeah. you could go regrow a It'd limb. It'd be amazing and, to not have to wait for someone for a transplant, someone else to die. You could create your own. Yeah. And then families could not even have to like donate their, you know, some people are very emotional about it. Even if they wanted that family member wanted to donate their organs, a lot of people don't. It's still weird. Like it'd be better for the family mentally if we could just engineer them. True. It's very. And, and that's the thing about it is there's so many pros and cons to it. It's like, yeah, which how do you judge it? Yeah. At the end of the day, I think it does more good. I just as of right now, yeah. I think it does until I've proven otherwise. It's like the Internet. You know, yeah, it really There's is pros and cons to that, too But it's probably done more good overall because it's connected people. Yeah, and we've like learned a lot as it We've grown as a society because of it We have actually. we have would you genetically engineer our child if you could no No, uh -uh. if you could pick basically everything about it No, because then that takes out the whole magic of it because then I would just the whole rest of my life I would think about fuck what if I was meant to have like a boy and I picked a girl instead, you know, or what if they were supposed to look a certain way and I'm fucking with it. I just like there are certain things in life that I personally will not mess with. Like that's destiny and I don't fuck it's with gonna destiny. Be a, it's going to be a moral battle later in our lifetimes, I believe. Like we're going to have yeah. some moral. But if someone else some wants stuff. to do that, then. Yeah, I mean, I mean some... whatever. Weird <laughs> stuff, man. I mean, we're certainly not going to be able to stop people. It's clearly headed that direction, right? It is. Okay, so let's see. So we wanted to get into um, Atlantis. And today, before we do that, we're going to do sponsors that's slightly different today. So bear with us. But today, we want to thank our first sponsor, Fleur. If you ever spritz on perfume every day, here's something you might not think about what's actually in it. Yeah, sadly. So that's why Kendall is excited about Fleur. Mm-hmm. They make stunning non-toxic perfumes and list all their ingredients online. You get a good scent made with clean ingredients and the sample process is just plain fun for luxurious perfume. That's all about good, clean, fun. Try Fleur, P-H-L-U-R. So it's it's really kind of cool. There's I actually looked at it and helped her pick it out. Um, but there's like a lot of good scents based on nature and stuff, which is cool. Yeah. It has a lot of uh, really like sandalwood blends. and different. Mm -hmm. What are those kinds of ingredients like? 
like different um, plant based ingredients, basically. Yeah, exactly. For the most part. Um, yeah, it smells really good. They're all like earth elements. They are. Um, and I love that they're, you know, gender neutral. So you can get a bottle and share it with like your spouse or partner. Yeah. And they actually just introduced body wash and body lotion in the same sense as well. So Dude, the it. scents are really, really nice. Yeah. They smell really good, like really good. So definitely check out their website because I guarantee you there's one that you're going to be like, Ooh, that's going to, that smells. I feel like a lot of people will. Yeah. There's, there's like, there's so many and... different ones that I wanted. I had to like narrow it down. <laughs> there's a bunch of different ones. Yeah. But if you want to check out Floor, go to Floor.com today to use promo code MileHire to get 20% off your first custom Floor sample set. Pick three cents to try and get credit towards a full-size bottle of your favorite scent. That's promo code MileHire at Floor.com to get your first three Floor fragrance <laughs> fragrances, fragrances samples at 20% off. P-H-L-U-R.com. We also want to thank Tord. Kendall knows all about Tord. Tell us about Tord. Torrid is a store that I have been shopping at legit since I was like 17. Um, I'll never forget, like my mom took me on this sh this shopping trip, like right before I went to college and we got a bunch of stuff and I went to a Torrid for the first time because we went to a mall that I normally didn't go to. And it's just like, it's such a good brand for women that have curves, um, women that just, you need material in certain places and less material in other places. And you're just built you know, differently. And that's how I am. So I've always loved wearing Torrid. I love their clothes. I love their designs. They have a lot of really simple colors as well, which I really appreciate because they have a lot of, you know, kind of crazy fun designs, but they also have a lot of, because I am in the boring lane for sure. I really like <laughs> neutrals. I like no patterns. Yeah. I yeah. don't really like patterns. So I just, I love how they have so much and even shoes, even shoes. They have and everything. I love their they shoes. They have everything. You can get your I, whole I got like there, winter I boots from them. Um, yeah, they're really awesome. And, you know, they're they're made with like a wider instep. And yeah. So yeah, it's curvy. Or this is, I guess, for brands 10 to 30. For sizes. I mean, yeah. sorry, yeah. sizes. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I normally don't read the ads. Yeah. So <laughs> experience toward for yourself, guys, right now. Just for our listeners, you can go to Tord.com and use promo code MileHire15 for $15 off every $50 you spend. That means you can get up to $150 off a $500 order. Again, that's Tord.com, promo code MileHire15 for $15 off every $50 you spend. Tord.com, promo code MileHire15. All right, let's fucking get into Atlantis, guys. Hell yeah. Atlantis is a story that we've all heard about, I'm sure, and have probably seen the movie and oh, yes. the Disney movie. That's where I first heard about Atlantis. Yeah, oh, me lie. too, for sure. I loved that movie. I thought Such it was so movie. like cool. I loved how the the people of Atlantis in the movie were like kind of like magical people. They had like white hair and like light oh, I thought up it was eyes. So cool. and, yeah. yeah, it was so cool. Yeah, just the idea of like an underwater civilization was. Like, and do you remember they powered their things with crystals? Do you they remember did. That? Yeah, they did. They would they like the use crystals. a crystal and like lock it into their spacecraft, and then they would like fly around in it. They they basically went off the legend that Atlantis was this ancient civilization that was highly advanced yep. techno technologically wise, like for the time, but also just in general, they were extremely advanced and like in the movie, they might have used crystals. So very interesting. And this is such an old story. It goes all the way back to the days of Plato, the mm -hmm. philosopher, the homie Plato and his teachers. Like a long ass time ago, right? It was. Very, very long time it's like ago. Like almost three thousand years or something. We're talking like three hundred sixty BCE. Damn. <laughs> Before Christ, I think. I, don't, I forget what the E stands for, but a long ass time ago, thousands of years ago. And Plato. If you've never heard of the great philosophers, there's a bunch of them. But Plato's or <laughs> Plato's. Plato was the student of Socrates, who is another famous philosopher. So Plato learned. I think basically everything he knew from Socrates and, you know, whatever Socrates knew and, you know, they, they, they provided a lot of works that we still have today, which some of you may have read before. There's like the cave, I think is one of them. There's like these kind of like stories almost that have yeah. these almost lessons to them. I, I almost think of it almost like Bible stories in a way. Cause like the Bible is kind of that way where there's lots of tales and fables and, or, you know, just stories that, have a message or something like that. So 
a lot of his works are like that because he's he's kind of the guy that's responsible for like Western philosophy, you know, and science. Really, a lot of it stemmed from uh, the work of Plato. Yeah. So, and even religion and spirituality, he's credited for as well. So, it's twenty four hundred years since his work was done, and we still have it today. It's amazing. So, but it's doesn't a, that make you think of all the other peoples we've lost? Oh yeah, well the Library of Alexandria, dude. Yeah. Imagine oh, everything that we lost in there. Oh no. We've lost a lot, and there's still a lot we haven't found. Yeah. So, so when we're talking about Atlantis, the original story of this lost island comes to us from two Socratic dialogues called Timaeus and Critias, which were written about 360 BC by Plato. Now these dialogues are like a speech essentially prepared by Plato to be told on the day of the Panathenia in honor of the goddess Athena. Athena. Just like my bunny. <laughs> yeah. They describe a meeting of men who had met the previous day to hear Socrates describe the Atlantis. So according to these dialogues that they had, Socrates asked three men to meet him on this day, Timaeus of Lacry and uh, Hermocrates of Syracuse and Critias of Athens. Socrates essentially asked these men to tell him stories about how the ancient Athens interacted with other states. The first to report was Critias, who told of how his grandfather had met with an Athenian poet and lawgiver, Solon, one of the seven sages. So th the way that this is recorded to me does kind of read as like a story in a way. It does a little bit. But yeah, but a lot of people argue that like back then, that's, that's how, how they most wrote, things right. were written. That's how they communicated. Yeah, I think that's very true too. I didn't. Yeah, you know, yeah, because it's not like they had like nonfiction fiction necessarily. Yeah, like, and they're not gonna no. A lot of people think it's just they like just stylistic, um, kind of like yeah, just like decorative history. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it makes sense. I mean, they're just gonna record it as it is, and you know the the translation we're reading could be different too than the actual way it was written in their language or in their language. You know. So it could be slightly different. But it's interesting because this Athenian poet Solon had been to Egypt where priests had compared Egypt and Athens and talked about the gods and legends of both lands. And one of these stories they heard was an Egyptian story about Atlantis. What's interesting to me is Egypt seems to know the most. Like, yeah, they so really much knowledge know goes back to Egypt. some stuff. Because if you consider Atlantis to be real, and to be this amazing advanced civilization in Egypt is recording their story, then it makes you wonder about how advanced and crazy the Egyptian civilization was probably at one point, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah. Because it's like, if they were interacting with this other civilization that was advanced, then Egypt was definitely advanced. And I mean, we know that they were pretty advanced, but it seems to me they may have been advanced on a whole other level. Yeah, like just a different even... way than we would imagine right we can't even possibly understand but basically according to the story atlantis ruled over several other islands and parts of the continents of africa and europe plato said that the continent lay in the atlantic ocean near the straits of gibraltar until its destruction ten thousand years previous so ten thousand years prior to that the nation there had been established by poseidon the god of the sea poseidon fathered five sets of twins on the island the firstborn named Atlant Atlas, had the continent and surrounding ocean named for him. Poseidon divided the land into 10 sections, each to be ruled by a son or his heirs. So what's interesting is there's kind of two descriptions from uh, these two writings from Plato, the uh, Critias and Timaeus. They both describe Atlantis a little bit differently. But um, so one's like my, kind of a more metaphysical one with the sense of the gods and goddesses, which we might be interpreting that completely wrong too. There could be some other element to that as mm -hmm. far, because I mean, we don't know whether the Greek gods could have been real or some type of real thing, or if they were just, you know, kind of imaginary gods. Yeah. So I don't know. That's, that's just interesting to me. But what was cool about Atlantis was that it was in, arranged in concentric rings of mm -hmm. alternating water and land. So like it was moats in between. It was set up very interesting for. Unlike anything in yeah. all of, civilization as we know it yeah definitely we I, I mean there's i don't think there's really any obviously there's cities kind of circular like that but not in the rings like that rings yeah so it kind of looks like um those islands in dubai 
Have you ever seen those? The like palm tree islands where yeah. they stay on them? Yeah. It's kind of like that, but. It does. Yeah, yeah. You know? No, almost like an artificial islands would yeah. be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it'd be weird for like in nature for that to occur. Well, know? I think they would have like set it up that way. I don't think it was really just three. Yeah, because these were like perfectly even rings. According. So you think they they built up the infrastructure on water and created those like man-made rings? Possibly, yeah. Versus it being like an area of land that was concentric circles. I guess. I mean, it's hard to say. I, yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing about this, guys. It's hard to say whether any of this hard is true because we don't know yeah. that much. I mean, so we're all speculating during this, just so you know. But apparently the land in Atlantis, the soil was very rich. The engineers technically accomplished the architecture extravagant with baths, harbor installations, and barracks. The central plain outside the city had canals and a magnificent irrigation system. But you they had plumbing mm -hmm. too. Yeah. Well, we know the Sumerians did, right? Pretty much. Yeah, I mean, tons of I, we have, there's evidence of tons of ancient cultures having some sort of system like yeah. that. Plumbing system. So I wouldn't be surprised if Atlantis did too. Um, but this uh, basically they also had kings and a civil administration as well as an organized military Their rituals matched Athens for bull baiting sacrifice and prayer so It seems like the way that he's describing it, it's a lot like you know Greece at that time probably the same state as Egypt So it seems like it's not necessarily like Atlantis is this much more like kind of higher advanced civilization but yet in line with the other civilizations at the time possibly yeah. but maybe a bit more advanced yeah, from what I've like kind of heard like heard historians talking about is that they think it's like it was kind of fancy. Like it's yeah. kinda, it was kind of like a high end. It's like place. Beverly Hills of yeah. ancient Civ. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, like it was just they were well. It's like where the elites were, maybe yes. some of the rulers of the Because I think it was small too, so like not that it was probably pretty exclusive. Well, I think they were like an imperial power. And really did have power. They had power over different islands and parts of Africa right. and, and Asia too. Like, but they it were, was like their home base was. Yeah, that. right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Totally. It just reminds me of like Game of Thrones or something. Yeah. Like how they're. I know. Uh, their different houses. It's really are set interesting up. to think about. It is. So they they had all of that going on it, but at the very center of Atlantis was a hill, and at the top of the hill was a temple to Poseidon. Inside yes. was a gold statue of the god of the sea, showing him driving six winged horses. But then it waged an unprovoked imperialistic war on the remainder of Asia and Europe. And when Atlantis attacked, Athens showed its excellence as the leader of the Greeks, the much smaller city-state, the only power to stand against Atlantis. Alone, Athens triumphed over, over the invading Atlantean forces, defeating the enemy, enemy, preventing the free from being enslaved and freeing those who had been enslaved. So that part of the story really makes it seem like they were kind of power hungry too. Like they wanted to kind of take over the world in a sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but what's interesting about this story and before we talk about the end of Atlantis, it's interesting to point out that there's uh, different points in the dialogues that Plato's characters refer to the story of Atlantis as genuine history and it yes. being within the realm of fact. Mm hmm. And it does seem like Plato put a lot of detail into the description of Atlantis that may not have been necessary. Right. He Yes. Yes. Like it, why? There was a lot of description. And like I said, there was so much written like this at this time. Like, a, like mostly everything, you know? It's just like the way, like how else would it be written? It's true. I mean, they're just describe. I mean, they can't record it with a video camera, so they have to like yeah. write it down and describe it really and, well. Yeah, and they're gonna make it sound. So artsy. the next person, yeah. Yeah, it's not like it was like then there was a sea monster, <laughs> you know, like they're not cavemen. It was in the realm of reality. Yeah, it's true. Uh, I don't know. It's it's really interesting. So basically, after this battle they had. And 9,000 years before the time of Plato was even around, the people of Atlantis, because they were so imperialistic, became corrupt and greedy. And the gods, yeah. so Zeus, who's uh, father to Poseidon, right? Yeah, um, Poseidon's god of the sea. Yeah, and that's what they think, that it was really Poseidon right. that they pissed off um, by being, yeah, like greedy and all about money. Yeah, it's interesting because Poseidon... Uh, had a son named Atlas the Titan who was the uh, son that we talked about that ruled over Atlas so 
that would make sense for why I was named Atlanta. Sorry, I'm just realizing that. It's clicking in my head. But yeah, so basically the tale is, or the story goes, that the gods got pissed because they were so greedy and decided to send a bunch of earthquakes and floods and tidal waves and shit. Or a tsunami, because yeah. it's the, you know, he's the god of the ocean, so he can right. send like horrible ocean things. <laughs> yeah. That's so Poseidon, did. yeah, sent a, sent a bunch of shit their way. Yep. Sank him, story. sank him, I guess. But, you know, this whole element to this story, there's kind of a moral here, like about being greedy and not, or you might right. get your ass wiped out by Poseidon. Um, so that also makes it feel a little bit more like a story, you know, like a cautionary tale. So I kind of see both sides. But then Although again, I really want to believe in Atlantis. And I kind of do more than I don't. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to give it the, a lot of the same credibility that you give the Bible. Like if you think about it, obviously there's a lot of proof to the Bible. Like there's a lot of things that there's a lot of things that actually happened in the Bible, but there are also a lot of things that we don't know for sure happened. But people right. that we consider reputable told us that. They yeah, happened. you mean compare it as in and yeah. compare it. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying. The stories are not written like, hey, this is fake. But right. like obviously it's kind of like. But then it's like, up what to about, the interpreter. Some people believe that. You know, Jonah the whale really did. Yeah, or, or whatever. Joshua <laughs> fought the battle of Jericho. It's not the whale is not named Jonah, right? No. No, Jonah, <laughs> Jonah is, is the, the guy who the prophet lived that in the was rail, yeah, the whale. Got swallowed. So up. some people believe like that really happened or the Noah's right. Ark really happened. And or, no offense to anyone out there who believes those are like factual events. I always thought they were supposed to be like like folk lore, like stories like for morals, you know? Yeah. That's well, what I that's how a lot of, that's how a lot of people would perceive that. that, but some people perceive that as facts. So it's the right. same reason why. So it's the same thing with Atlantis. Someone might perceive Plato's writings as facts. Yeah. In a way. And the Bible's written Thousands, very yeah. differently yeah. than you do. Yeah. So that, that's just the comparison that I'm making is like, that's why I think, you know, if you're going to take, you know, the Bible seriously and, and the stories in it seriously, then we should at least take Atlantis seriously, which I think a lot of people have because people are so fucking interested in it, want to find it and think it's out there. So I just thought that was really interesting. Um, so if Atlantis actually existed, where was it? Where in the world was it? And oh, there's a million answers to this because mm -hmm. people are constantly trying to figure out where it could be. There's always like search teams and dive teams. And you know, when people, people come upon islands that look weird or sometimes they see things under the sea that look, you know, kind of weird or unidentifiable. Or they try to just like figure out for, based on what he described in the story, like where it would be. Um, yeah, exactly. Where it would be in the world, because he did he did kind of give a specific idea of a general area like the Mediterranean mm -hmm. area as mm -hmm. to being where Atlantis was. So when you start looking at the theories and, you know, you start thinking about like a lot of people, a lot of mainstream historians and archaeologists completely think Atlantis is made up, uh, you know, never really existed. There is no artifacts to find. There is no evidence of it out there. Well, because it could be really fucking old. Like, let's all remember. OK, so this was passed down to Socrates and then Socrates tells Plato. So think of how old thousands this is. And, and this is years. this is like the Bible in a sense that it was take a story that was taken and rewritten and passed down. So obviously it's like playing a game of telephone. You're going to miss things. There's going to be missed major details. Like Plato could have had like a very small, small bit of the actual story and the truth of Atlantis because he just heard Socrates talking about it as a child. Yeah. He heard yeah. about it as a child. It's true. So, but I don't, that doesn't mean it's not true. If, I mean, these, all these grown men, like important men like Socrates were saying you know, and passing this on. It was obviously important. Yeah. Um, I mean, this idea that all these ancient people just like told stories all the time is, is kind of ridiculous. <laughs> they just must have been smoking weed and just yeah, reading yeah. stories, just having making fun. up these wild places they thought no, they I saw. No, I think they were, I think in his mind, he could have thought, well, you know, this is a story from the past that isn't told that clearly was important. Let me retell the story of Atlantis, the best that I know it. And then obviously he'd have to make up some shit. He'd have to, you know, so there you go. <laughs> well, I mean, and that's why a lot of, I mean, that's why a lot of historians think otherwise and think that maybe Socrates or uh, Plato, I'm sorry, was confusing, you know, just kind of renaming a different culture and civilization. Could have been Atlantis. Cause one of the most popular theories is that Atlantis was the land of the Minoan culture, yes. which is, 
ancient Crete and Terra. Right. Right. So it and when you look at Min uh Minoan Crete and the surrounding islands, they do bear a striking resemblance to what Plato described as Atlantis. And archaeological records show that the Minoan culture spread its dominion throughout the nearby islands of uh, Aegean, very roughly from 3,000 years BC to about 1400 BC. Crete was the capital for the Minoan people with an advanced civilization with language, shipping, com complex architecture, rituals, and games. So similarities in the civilizations, but... I don't know. I, I think that Atlantis is so specific that, you know, I think it's just kind of convenient to say, oh, yeah, it's it, they he was talking about the Minoan civilization, but it's still very different. But if you look at the uh, artifacts that they found, you can kind of see why they would maybe draw some comparisons and yeah, think that, you know, maybe Atlantis was really just the Minoan civilization because of the you know, temples and shrines being really decorated and the architecture was... Ins maybe it was inspired by... Well, that's the thing. And, and I think it just shows at that time, though, we've seen across all the ancient cultures thousands of years ago, they were all doing this kind of thing in, a, in their way, one way or another. You know, it might be different. Wouldn't it be so cool to just go back and see all this? Like, Wouldn't just it? Just to time travel. I know. God, dude. <sighs> I mean, it makes not... me sad that, like, there's so many people's stories that have lived at one time that are like gone, you know, that just buried and that we'll just never know. Yeah, like thou millions and millions and millions of people's stories. Our ancestors. I know. Imagine if we had like YouTubers in ancient times that could like <laughs> it, oh my somehow gosh, record yeah. that what we're their like, life all right, was let's like. Pull up videos from we could go back to twenty six hundred BCE. <laughs> let's it's see like, what's hey guys, going on. I'm vlogging. <laughs> That'd be so interesting. Oh, well, let's Plato hope just that. put out a new book, guys. It's gonna be lit. Gonna go to the drop. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag Atlantis is Manoa. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's funny. Yeah, there were some really cool designs, though. God, I love how they had, like, I'm seeing a ton of, I know that they had tons of bulls. The um, bull is very important to the, the Atlantean Minoans culture. And the Atlanteans, yeah. And they share that similarity. They yeah. both worship bulls. Right. Um, which is really interesting. It makes me feel good as a Taurus. And another thing that's interesting is that um, Plato said that Atlantis was destroyed in one day. Yes. And yes, there's a lot of reasons crazy. to believe that the Minoan civilization was the same way, that they got destroyed in the, in one day. And it was really quick. Whereas the, the Minoans, the volcano erupted on what is now the island of Santorini, which mm. for those that don't know, Santorini is about 85 miles north of Crete. And when the volcano erupted, it blocked out the sun for days and the ash traveled to Crete and then it started dumping tons of volcanic ash on them, causing all types of catastrophic events to happen. Obviously on that shit, got hot ash, flame and ash coming down on you. Like, oh, dude, that's like, that's a hard oof. way to go. <laughs> oh, yeah. Imagine like, is. fuck. Yeah. Like dude. the whole city that we're in. If just lava got, doesn't get you or you don't drown from taken out by a volcano. Is rough. I guess you wouldn't drown. <laughs> no, I'm talking about. But, but yeah. the thing about it is Plato never mentions that Atlantis went down from a volcano. So that's where the big disconnect is between that theory, I think, is that mm -hmm. the Minoans were taken down by a volcano versus Atlantis was uh, pushed underwater, you know, tidal waves, tsunamis, that so kind the, of thing. Yeah, they think it kind of... Earthquakes kind of sunk into sunk, the ocean. Yeah. yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. That Because it was probably, if it was a real place, it was probably built on, like I said, sand. So a it would be or easy to yeah. be swiped away, basically. Totally. Like it could have all been washed out to sea, and that's why we don't find a lot of it. Or um, a lot of people are like, you know, like we've talked about, there's no proof of Atlantis. There's no like, you know, figurines or anything. But there are so many little figurines and things that they have found under underwater that they don't know what civilizations from. They don't know what time period. There are things like that that could belong to Atlantis or could be something that we've already decided belongs to something else and it actually belongs to the same time but atlantis i mean yeah it's, it's yeah. hard to find proof for something that technically doesn't exist yeah it is <laughs> or if you don't even know where to look necessarily either so right. the ocean's really fucking big it covers like it is 90 percent of our planet so it is really fucking big it could be anywhere underwater but even if it's in that area i mean the ocean's super deep i can't believe we still can't just like scan the ocean like it's so much, dude. There's we've only that's how big it is. Of it. 
miles deep. It's just wild. Isn't it wild to think yeah. about? Like we live on this tiny little thin oh surface. Oh my God. And if you type in <laughs> like go to YouTube planet. and type in like monsters of the deep or like creepy things found underwater, oh, like, oh my God, it will show. It, uh, it will freak you out. You it don't need really, to go really to other freaky. planets for aliens, guys. No, There's, they're, they're fucking literally down, down there. You can swim down. Well, no, you cannot. You can take a <laughs> submarine. No, but normally they get videos from people's from like uh, oil drilling things that have cameras attached to them or people that are watched like moving the cameras from above shore just to keep an eye on the drills and they see like the craziest shit swim by. Dude, there is some weird stuff down there. Yeah, there, is. <laughs> there really is. Definitely is. So, God, but I want to talk about where archaeologists think Atlantis is. Um, some out there that have worked with like National Geographic, some of the more mainstream guys think that Atlantis may lie in the Donana National Park in southern Spain. That's what I really thought. And like when I did a video on Atlantis, I was like really new to making this type of content and I like didn't do a full spectrum of research I feel like because I decided like really quickly that I thought this one was where it was because the yeah. documentary was there's been a that. ton of documentaries like that where they're like oh we're gonna go find Atlantis and they look in one yeah. area and they don't find anything really yeah I need to just like redo it redo the video because <laughs> <laughs> it's all right it's all good I mean nobody knows so that's the thing is you can't really go wrong yeah and this guy did have a ton of research and like a lot of good evidence they did well, it seems like a really good area. I mean, it's it's hundreds of square miles across, and it's like Martian yeah. land. Yeah, and and there's evidence of the rings too. Right, like they've done sound testing. They've like found they believe it's under shapes the, right? under the ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they did. They did a bunch it's of out studies the out there to try yeah. to figure out. And they did find the patterns that they were looking for to show that there was something underneath. Right. Well, if you but they weren't getting permission to go dig it up. Well, remember they got the like bird's eye view of the area and they were able to yeah. see what the underground looked like and there is this like circular yes. piece of land yes, circular there's... shaped mm -hmm. under the ground mm -hmm. so they think it could have been a giant tsunami came and basically washed that whole section out to sea and it all just like flowed out and it's gone yeah which and like is we possible. said we've explored five fucking percent of the ocean you know how much shit could be hiding out there dude like think well, of needle, the needle too. in the haystack theory. Like it's like that, but by like so much fucking <laughs> by an worse. infinite multiplier. <laughs> Seriously, because thousands of years have gone by. The ocean's yeah. constantly moving. Yeah. There's constantly movement. Shit eating off the. I mean, shit gets yeah. covered up. So. Things just fall apart too. Like, be, a lot of things. Uh, God. We don't know what materials they were using. There, there's a treasure trove of oh, artifacts. I and, know. Just information treasures. Underneath. Imagine if we could just do a giant scan of the whole ocean, get anything important out like immediately. It'd be crazy. Yeah, we could like create a laser map or something. And just like, like pull it all out. <laughs> like, oh, look at all this. I'd be crazy. I yeah, bet we'd find like a giant everything. metal detector. You know how much money's under there? Imagine how many fucking diamonds. Diamonds. Sc bodies, skulls, yeah, and probably shit. Be an alarm treasure, of old bodies. treasure hidden and buried under the ocean in like caves and Shipwrecks, shit. Shipwrecks, mm -hmm. trash. Gold, There'd be... So much uh, antiques. And... We'd find all of those like pirate crashes because there's yeah. there's metal stuff that will never dissolve. Right. That's just sitting there. Yep. Waiting to be discovered. Deep, deep, deep though. As yeah. fuck, motherfucker. It's and that's the thing. We haven't mastered. The, I can't believe we haven't mastered the ability to like stay underwater for unlimited amounts of times. Yeah. Yet no. we're going to and space. And we can't even go all the way down, I don't think. Can we go all the way down to the very deepest Not part to of the, the Marianas Trench, yeah, no. no. The deepest parts it's of the ocean, no. The pressure, I think, would kill us. I don't think, we, yeah. I think it's the pressure. It's just, yeah. It, I can't go deeper than 10 feet. <laughs> like, I'm not even kidding. I go to like I have five and ears. I'm like, oh. When I was a kid, my ears, I blew an eardrum. So, like, I could never go underwater. I tried to scuba dive in a pool as a kid. And I couldn't even reach the deep end. <laughs> and I still can't really do it. Josh like really wanted to go scuba diving. It's funny because he is like, he's so scared of the ocean. In Hawaii, we were just snorkeling and he freaked out. He's like, we have to get out of here. Hey, you know what? The, the, again, the you're always scared of the unknown. The ocean is territory, man. I'm not I, I get it. it. I was freaked out too. We, so we were swimming and then I was ahead of Josh and I was kind of like going really fast and like showing off. And then all of a sudden this giant black spotted eel yeah. went past me and I didn't see it. Josh Five, saw it. He said it six just went right long. next to me had like a huge like three foot fish on either side of it swimming with it i couldn't believe it like i'm i'm surprised i didn't just i just like froze i was just like uh, yeah like and then stiff. you had to get the fuck out of there you freak freaked out. me out because i'm like dude yeah. that's bigger than me but i mean obviously it's not going to touch me or it just swam <laughs> by me but 
Yeah. It freaks you out when you don't yeah. see. I've never seen that before. So yeah. I was like, oh, Think shit. of the other shit that's in there. That's not the scariest thing in the ocean, my friend. <laughs> that's yeah, going to look like your friend if you see the rest of the stuff that's under there. My God. It's very true. Creepy. But one of the other things that these guys that were looking at uh, the site in the Donana National Park said was that there's like an area where it looked like there was a rectangular object under the ground. Yes. And after figuring out the dimensions of this area of this object, they discovered it was almost exactly the size of the temple of Poseidon that Plato described. Right. So, yeah. And, and I think it could make a lot of sense for it to be in that spot for sure. I mean, what are the chances, though, that you go to that spot to see and then that shit's under there and it's the same size? Like mm, That's very weird. That's pretty crazy. It really is weird. So and, there's a good chance it was in this park. Yeah, so. and Atlantis was like a port city. We know that. They yes. had harbors and stuff. Yeah, so they were a port city. They would be with access to the ocean. I don't know if they would be an island, though. You know, like harbors, I think. You know, yeah. would it be an island? I don't think it was an island. Or would it be like, it could be like an island contained within. I think it was kind of like Venice. A bay. You know, in Italy. How like a kind floating of built through city it. yeah in a way yeah. kind of on top built on top of the or water. at one time it was uh like above water and then water rose over time and like they yeah worked it was around just straight it. up global warming back then i don't i mean yeah i don't know <laughs> i don't know um but i i know that they like um had really well according to the legend they had really important precious metals and like things that were really rare and that other countries like Egyptians would travel there and it would take them years and they would go all the way there just to get whatever they yeah, had. Yeah. They had special a special you, type of metal. I believe they I thought they called it Crete. Yeah, but, that sounds I think that sounds right. Yeah. But yeah. It was like a type of copper mixed with something else. That was Well, there's like, probably more than just that that they were trading between. I'm sure they had Different oh yeah, things they all needed. But that's what they were really known for because that was like it was like exclusive to that area, and that's why, that's another reason I think it's at this park is that area has, has that, that metal. right has been found there. It's Crete there, yeah. Yeah, then they were able to the archaeologists were able to figure out that there's a significant layer of methane gas trapped several meters below the surface. Yes, and methane gas is created when organic matter decomposes. So if civilization got wiped out, yeah. There would be a lot of methane a bunch there, probably. Of dead bodies. Yeah, there was a lot of methane when they looked. Crazy. Which, mm, I mean, I don't know. After thousands of years, the methane would still be trapped there, and it's not like there was millions of people there. So, well, I think it would, would still, the be, gas trapped still there? be there. How else would it get out? Yeah. <laughs> Matter cannot be created or destroyed. It's not like it just disappeared. No, it couldn't it just get moves. above. It would just stay there. Yeah, maybe. If it's that far down, it's not going to come through the sand. Maybe, yeah, maybe just over time. It, I don't know. It's like... It's pretty mind-blowing to think about. <laughs> it is. But why is it there? They have a detector. It it's is. not like they're making it up. It is there. So. And they said that they did some dives in that area and they found some concrete blocks, they said, that looked man-made. Mm, there you go. So that's... Because, I mean, the other possibility is it wasn't Atlantis at all. It could just be some other civilization we didn't fucking know about. It's I possible, believe too. also this location, there's another location close to it that was um, basically a mini version of what a lot of people think is Atlantis, but it's like a small city that was that looks to be have all almost set up as like a memorial spot, like a remembrance of this is what Atlantis looked like because it's too small for anyone to actually like live in this little. Yeah. yeah it's yeah, like yeah. a model. It's weird. Interesting. But there was also nearby um, evidence that there was mining going on. So like you said, they were after the metal because there was, you know, the gold and copper and stuff. Yeah. So it's, I mean, that maybe they were in the area mining gold and shit and trading it with other, other civilizations. I think gold was pretty heavily sought after for sure. So that, that's just one possibility. That's just uh, one location, not the one that I think is um, the most likely one, which is what we'll talk about next. But First, I just want to thank our last sponsors for the day. Upstart, if you're applying for a loan, it's a lot like applying for a job that you don't get to interview for. Instead, loan companies make their decisions based off your credit score and history without getting to know the whole you. Now, thanks to Upstart.com, and never has been uh, be that way again. Upstart is revolutionizing the way you borrow money by rewarding you for your job experience and education in the form of a smarter interest rate, which is really nice if you're just starting out like I was a few years ago. God, I'm getting old, but... When I was first starting out, it's hard to get loans, hard to get, you know, for school, for a car. 
So, you know, they don't, they go off your credit score and, you know, they don't look at your education or work history, but Upstart does not do that. They consider all of those factors when determining um, your uh, credit worthiness. So that makes it really nice, convenient. It only takes two minutes to find out what your uh, interest rate would be. Hurry to upstart.com slash mile higher to find out how low your Upstart rate could be. Again, your rate, uh, it only takes two minutes to check your rate and it won't affect your credit, which is awesome. That's upstart.com slash mile higher. We also wanted to thank stamps.com for their continued support of the show. Posted rates have gone up again, but thankfully stamps.com can ease the pain with big discounts off post office of retail rates. Stamps.com automatically calculates and prints the exact amount of postage you need for every letter or package you send. You'll never have to overpay or underpay again. Stamps.com brings all the services of the U.S. Postal Service right to your fingertips. Buy and print an official U.S. postage for any letter any package, any class of mail using your own computer and printer and they make it easy and they'll send you a free digital scale to automatically calculate the exact postage you need. Uh, it does really make uh, getting your packages ready to send for the post office extremely easy and convenient. You can do it all from your computer, print it out, set up a pickup even from the post office. So you don't even have to go to the post office and it just saves you a ton of time and money and right now our listeners can get a special offer that includes a four-week trial uh, plus free postage in a digital scale. See for yourself why over 700,000 small businesses use stamps.com. Yes, I do love it because we use it for our small business for sending out business documents and such. So all you got to do is go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in mile higher. That's stamps.com. Enter code mile higher. All Boom. right. Boom. Done. All right. Let's let's get back into this. So this this next location is the one that I think is very interesting and, and perhaps maybe where um, the the city actually did live or the civilization. And that is something called the Rakat structure or the Eye of the Sahara. Mm -hmm. This is a very interesting. Uh, it's an actual physical natural feature in the ground in the country of uh, Mauritania in Northwest Africa where the Mari people were once led by a king there named Adla Atlas. Sorry, I almost said Atlantis. Mm. Atlas. So right off the bat from their history, yep. they had a king named Adla Atlas, which same as Atlantis. So that's very interesting. So there was this Greek historian named Herodotus from 484 BC to 425 BC. And one of his achievements was creating what was considered to be the most accurate map of the known world at the time. And if you're look, if you're listening to this, there's a map that shows Africa, and it shows uh, specifically this area where um, on the map it shows Atlantis, where he marked an area known as Atlantis. Mm. So th this structure, this natural f formation in the ground, is in the same area on the modern day map as this um, ancient Greeks map. So very interesting that there's that right off the bat. But not only that, if you're looking at this structure and if you're listening, it literally is concentric circles in the ground, though. And there's three of them. So there would be uh, three that would be water and two that would be land. So that so that's very similar to uh, the actual description that Plato gave. Yeah. Right off the bat. And mm -hmm. it's right there. This isn't under the ground. This is right yeah. out where we can see it, which is really interesting. How big is it? So the structure is the same size that Atlantis was described to be 14.5 miles diameter. So it's, it's big, but it's not that big. And it's also has an opening to the south of it, which matches Atlantis's description of the south connecting to the sea. And if you're watching, here's some pictures of it from Ariel. I mean, that's, that's, that's really insane. cool. And look really how concentric cool. they are. And the circles are very, They're, yeah, clearly not just nature. No way that that's, was made. That's nature. Whether That's or not crazy. it was Atlantis, yeah. though. Like, yeah. there, it's possible there have been other um, civilizations out there who built similar ones to Atlantis or, like, copied from what Plato had said or that maybe that was it's just true. kind of like a model that some places were using. Or I don't know. Yeah, it's really weird because it That's does really... The description of the Rakat structure is very similar to the way that Plato described small. Atlantis with the mountains on the north side that lead to very deep drops that contain rivers. Um, he also said Atlantis uh, had buildings made from lots of black, red, and white rocks. And this area has a lot of rocks that match the colors. Interesting. Right? 
And apparently, I just think like how how small it is though. Fourteen miles, and then you have to think though that it's not like that whole space though can be used. Like but you're only getting out. these little rings. Yeah. It so does seem it really cuts small. the space down in half already because of the water that's there. But we don't know how they built it though. You know, they could have had built over the water too. You know what I'm saying? Like maybe the water ran underneath it like it wasn't open to the air, you know? Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, sort of. Like they lived on the water as well? Yeah, or they built structures on top of the water, so I'm saying like stilts, you know, over water. So maybe the water was there, but they, they utilized it, but they also no, like but the had rings, bridges over it or the something. The rings where there's like moats. They oh, yeah, moats. where there would actually so be. So that takes out all that space. Look at all the space that was a moat. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, the, so that the proportion cuts down of land. The of space that people were. This was like supposed to be a place where people lived. No, that's true. Pretty but small. I don't know. It's pretty small. It could have been eroded away over time. I'm just saying that it could have changed over time. If something well, actually no, happened. Because it's three circles that are perfect circles. How okay. would they have gotten smaller all at once? No, I'm just saying from natural disasters, from the just natural evolution yeah, of the earth. Yeah, I understand what you're saying, but, but you still, still think... <laughs> how would that? How would it change unless it just kept shrinking as a whole? It's still perfect circles. There's no yeah, way it yeah. was changed shape by. Um, yeah, it's just weird. Mm, yeah, I mean, you got a great point there. Actually, it's not a lot of area to work with, but no. I mean, I don't know how but far we, yeah, up we this don't know how big it too. was either. Like, it's not could like be like knew. that. Could be like a space picture for all we know. Like, yeah, that that's you're looking cool. at. It could be smaller. It's pretty zoomed out. I'll, I'll add a note there, but that yeah, yeah, that's a great point though. I mean, it, it was isn't clearly that big. something built by people though. But that's yeah, no, it totally was because there's just so many things that suggest that there was actually a well there that pr produced fresh water. Um, there's other wells in the areas that produce salt water because Plato wrote about how there was fresh spring well water at the center of Atlantis. So, uh, that's one possibility. What's weird though and interesting is that this area where the structure is, is completely remote and not many people have been to that area. <coughs> Sorry. Oh, you okay there? Need <sighs> Sorry. Need, <a> drink. <laughs> Need <laughs> some right. milk. Oh my God. Okay, so not many people have visited the area, but archaeologists have still found many different artifacts in the area, but they have no clue what civilization actually made them. Which, which is goes what to I was your point, earlier. yeah. Yeah. We don't really know what things belong to. Right. The pictures I mean, are at taken. At the end of the day, we're trying to put together a picture that we have like it's like someone tore up a fucking puzzle or mixed you know, we're we're working with nothing here. You know? It's so hard to say you know how much can historians and archaeologists truly know for a fact it's not like they were there we don't and and again like you said it could be a completely different civilization i mean they found uh remnants of elements skeletal remains of elephants in the structure and plato also wrote about elephants in atlantis so yeah. it's interesting there you go so yeah i mean i think it's i think it's a possibility for sure but it does seem like 14 if you're we're thinking 14.5 miles in diameter. That's still pretty big. It's a decent size. And the pictures that we were just looking at were like a satellite view of the Rakat structure. I mean, it's very possible. And, you know, a mm -hmm. lot of this uh, person that's done a really great job at looking at this idea is uh, Bright Insight, Jimmy, mm -hmm. on YouTube. He's got a great channel, does a ton of research on mm -hmm. these ancient civilizations and things like that. And he's measured out things. And, yeah, I mean... Uh, he makes a really great case for this being where Atlantis could be if it existed. So, yeah, that's, I don't know. I think it's a very strong possibility. Um, but what's interesting is when you talk about the end of Atlantis, um, is we start looking at the time frame that which Atlantis was destroyed. And, you know, when we first heard about the story, which was when Salon visited Egypt 2,600 years ago, and so we know Atlantis existed 9,000 years earlier. So when you actually add 9,000 years to 2,600 uh, years, it equals 11,600 years, which means that Atlantis should have been destroyed at around 11,600 years ago. Yeah. And this is significant because of the fact of something called the Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis, which occurred about 11,600 years ago. And basically what this hypothesis is, is that a large comet fragmented, so in multiple pieces 
Like a shower of fire. A shower of, yeah, a shower of fire impacted the earth would cause a huge disaster. Like how any um, movie, like dinosaur movie, in, like shows. Yeah, but way the, worse than that. It, way worse than yeah. that even? Yeah, Why? like it was, well, it was just like multiple, almost like multiple comets hitting the oh, planet at damn. one time. Hopefully that doesn't Just fucking getting pounded again. by by this uh, impact. Damn. So with this, a number of different chemical signatures, carbon dioxide, nitrate, ammonia, and others, all seem to indicate that an astonishing 10% of the Earth's land surface was consumed by fires, or 10 million square kilometers were consumed by fire. So the whole, like a ton of the planet was on fire at this point. Oh, that's so scary to think about. Which created a ton of ash in the sky, which killed sunlight for days. I wonder days what that and... made the Earth look like from space, like what that would look like on a satellite. God, that would look crazy. Yeah. Like if the space station had a view of Earth getting pummeled yeah. by, actually the space station probably wouldn't survive. No. It would have got wiped out. Yeah, yeah, everything in space would get wiped out. Well, not everything in space, but everything around us. But can you imagine like 10 million square miles just on fire and ash filling the sky to the point where it yeah. gets so, it's dark for it's days. And all of our vegetation dies, animals start dying. And eventually, if it hangs around long enough, like in this type of event, you hit go into an ice age. Yeah. Because there's no sunlight. It's like a complete reversal. Yeah. So that's but that's is that how it like I thought about maybe that's how it's supposed to go. Like maybe how that's how the planet resets. Yeah. Well that's the thing is like, is that just a part of the cycle? Like, is this gonna happen again? And that's that's what's really interesting about this hypothesis and and one that has been uh, put forward by Graham Hancock, who's a really interesting author and uh, journalist and scientist in many respects. Uh, he's written a lot about this idea of a lost civilization such as Atlantis existing, but getting wiped out by this massive, almost apocalyptic event <laughs> where comets just rain down on the earth, sending us into an ice age and the temperatures uh, are freezing. That's so and everything. wild to think about. To Isn't like it that happening? Oh my gosh. What do you even do? Yeah. You can't like hide in your house. And there's evidence of this type of impact, uh, near canada actually i think it if i remember it's like under greenland or something there's like a huge impact crater of something so there's there's a lot of evidence for this theory but a lot of mainstream archaeologists scientists out there throw it out and and don't don't think that there's any evidence that this happened but just to spoil you and make you uh nervous a little bit at the to end of this, his book graham hancock actually believes that it might return again in our lifetime Great. I'm not even gonna tell you the year because I don't want to freak you guys out. Fuck no! You got to read it? his book to what figure is it? it out. No, t tell them now. <laughs> Are All you right. Kidding so me? he believes that this comet that pummeled us once, or Phoenix, as, as it's referred to, will return by or before the year 2040. And there is danger that one of the objects in his debris stream may be as much as 30 kilometers in diameter, or almost 19 miles in diameter. So a, some type of comet what the fuck or are we gonna do? astral object 19 miles wide uh, hit the planet. But what's, why does he think that? Well, you'll have to read his book to figure that out. We'll uh, have to ask him himself. Uh, wouldn't that be cool? That would be a dream to get him on. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's done a lot of research. I, I haven't read through his entire book and stuff, so I don't know the details on that. But That's really scary. I don't he does that. have a lot. He has calculated a lot of things that could suggest this. So it's, it is very interesting. Um, yeah, I really hope. Not. <laughs> yeah, let's hope not. Well, that's the thing and I think that's why We're gonna start weaponizing space more yeah. than it is now because I think that is on everybody's radars whether yeah. good or bad or Elite or whatever none of us want right. to be taken out by an asteroid or a comet or something. So Yeah, that's uh <laughs> Very interesting, but the next thing I wanted to talk about is uh, Somebody named Edgar Casey if you've never heard of Edgar Casey, very, very interesting individual, very famous psychic. Josh's grandparents are like Edward Casey super fans. Like, not even kidding. They fucking they're stans. I believe, if I remember correctly, don't oh, sorry, quote I me said on this. Edward, Edgar. Sorry, Edgar, always say Edward. Yeah. <laughs> they are super fans. Edgar Casey. And what's interesting about him is he's he like was raised Christian and he's like very Christian, but he also is like a psychic and yeah. and communicates. Healer. Healer, exactly. He's known as the sleeping prophet. He's like a Wiccan, yeah. He's a sleeping He'd give prophet. readings. Yeah. He would lay in his office and give readings and sleep and then like remotely connect with his patient. 
so bizarre. But he made a lot of interesting references to Atlantis through his readings and that he did with his his patients and it's very very interesting actually. So if you don't know a little bit more about Edgar Casey, he's considered one of the most prolific prophets in modern history. Like I said, my grandparents love his book, um love his teachings and uh readings, really believe that he was a healer. I believe my grandfather actually was healed by him, actually had a reading by him. I'll have to double check with him, but he's definitely told me something like that where he had a physical ailment. He was like a medical healer, like he knew a lot about healing the body. And there's a lot of great works by him that are interesting reads, whether you believe believe it or him or not, or believe that he knows something, you know, perhaps divine in a sense about these different topics. But he was a healer um, from what people, you know, who knew him and knew of his work believed and many believe he's more famous than even Nostradamus because he had 14,000 I've heard even up to over 20,000 different readings so he had a ton of readings and he was also more accurate than other philosophers and he usually gave his psychic readings for people that were in great difficulty or suffering and he never asked for money which is interesting and he never took advantage of them However, besides re offering readings to people, he also prophesied about world events past and future. And one of those events that he basically spoke about was the lost city of Atlantis. And his predictions and visions of his Atlantis were about his discovery, history, and destruction. So he got a lot of information on it. Edgar Casey maintained that Atlantis was the first civilization which was technologically superior to even our own. So let that sink in for a moment and think, whoa, Atlantis... You know, if you think about the most technically advanced, technologically advanced cities in the world, you think of like, uh, you know, you think of Tokyo for one, you think of New York City, you think of, you know, uh, what's the place in Malaysia or uh, Kuala Lumpur, uh, I probably said that Kuala Lumpur, I think is how you say it. That place is uh, really cool too. But think about a, you know, an ancient civilization that was even more advanced than those cities existing. That is what Edgar Casey said. Uh, was a truth about Atlantis. He added that its last surviving islands had disappeared somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean about 10,000 years ago. So this uh, lines up with Plato. Um, Casey revealed that the size of Atlantis was equal to that of Eurasia. He saw visions of this continent of the past, which had gone through three major periods of division. The first two occurred around 1500, 1600 BC when the mainland divided into islands. The three main islands of Atlantis were Poseidon, Og, and Arian. He claimed that the Atlanteans were well-versed in technology that harnessed the power of the quantum world. This included the use of crystals and sound waves for healing. So I was just saying that he believed that, you know, Atlantis had was even more technologically superior than any civilization today. This is what Edgar Casey said through the information he received about Atlantis. That would be so cool. I would just Wouldn't love it? to see what it would be like. That they had like. crystals and stuff, that they used crystals and yeah, or they really sound knew how to healing, harness. vibrations, frequencies, I tune think, people. I think the basic difference is that um, between us and them, kind of from what I've heard would be that they were like more advanced, but they were also, le sorry, they were also more spiritually advanced and like in touch with the universe and harmonics, the way it all works, so. Makes yeah, because like we're we're pretty like far behind in that aspect. You know, we could we might be techni technologically advanced, but our not, consciousness is not yeah, all that advanced. We're not that evolved consciously, right. Yet, right? So maybe they were of higher consciousness, higher density, or something like. Maybe they're just like a higher level of beings that lived in Atlantis, because Edgar Casey claimed that they were well versed in technology uh, that harnessed all those different things. They had elevators and connecting tunnels operating with compressed air and steam and they use quartz crystal science to mine gold copper and silver from the earth so cool right they were adept uh, to the use of silicone chips at levels unrivaled in the modern world the crystal skull for example is cut with such infinite precision that no known modern tool could have replicated the job they really? were familiar yeah isn't that wild interesting because they were familiar with the amplification power of crystals and laser technology, which is true. We do use crystal yeah. quartz and stuff in laser. So they already knew this technology and memory chips. Wow, interesting. They also made use of or extensive use of mass mental telepathy, 
psychokinesis and astral projection into oh, fourth so dimensional consciousness. Yeah, so they were like advanced as hell. On all levels, spiritually, technologically, yeah. if they were yeah. uh, able to do this. He went on to say that the people of Atlantis had constructed giant laser-like crystals for power plants and that these were responsible for the second destruction of the land. Casey blamed the final destruction of Atlantis and the disintegration of their culture on greed and lust. Interesting. So that lines up with Plato too. Now, if you think that this guy has any credibility or you know, you look into his work and you're like, wow, this guy was pretty legitimate. It makes you really start thinking like, could this information be more accurate perhaps, or maybe what Plato was trying to convey, just he couldn't word it in a way that we'd understand or something. And maybe yeah. he's receiving that message and translating it for us now so that we'd understand it. Yeah, that's interesting to think about. Isn't it? He also revealed that before the legendary land disappeared under the waves, there was an exodus of Atlanteans to ancient Egypt, which there is some evidence in ancient Egypt of Atlantis yes. being in contact with them. Yes. Being, seeing They're that like name doing there. doing business together. And yeah, stuff. isn't that? God, fucking Egyptians, man. They know so much. He attributed the biblical great flood of Noah to be the result of the sinking in the last huge, huge remnants of Atlantis. So it does fall in line of this idea of sinking under the sea or waves coming over. And there is evidence of some type of great flood that happened um, in history. So mm -hmm. it's very possible that this civilization is at the bottom of the ocean, which is honestly seems very likely at this yeah. point. But he said that many Atlanteans actually managed to escape and hoped to preserve a record of their civilization. Mm -hmm. So they decided to create two separate archives with all of their history and accomplishments so they could preserve them. Casey said that the Atlanteans buried one of the archives under one of the Sphinx paws. That's so interesting. Isn't Again, it? we go back to the Sphinx. Dude, Everything we look connected. at, so many things go back to something important is buried in or under or on or part Sphinx. of the Sphinx. That shit's been there so long. Yeah, dude. It's been there and we so long. And can't, like, go look. God. Wouldn't it be nice if you and I could just hop on a plane and go see for ourselves? Like, go <sighs> check under the paw? Why can't we figure it out? Why can't we because look? Because they won't let us, dude. They don't There's want us reason. to find whatever's of there. Of course not. Because it's probably buried, you know, not only for to keep it away from destruction, but also... To keep it from being destroyed or it could literally be a vault of information it could it could be like a giant thing Holding. of how their how their things worked how their tools and everything what if it was just hiding this like giant secret giant entity or crystal or something that Ooh. we would find if we looked inside of it or took it apart or looked under the paw i don't know it's really interesting but during casey's otherworldly journeys he would often reveal the past lives of those that came to him for information concerning their health, which is a common thing that psychics do. And he told a number of them that they had past lives in Atlantis. In fact, he revealed that a vast number of souls who lived past lives in Atlantis had been incarnating to America for a long time now. That's another thing that's so interesting, interesting about him is he's like a Christian that like wholeheartedly believes in reincarnation. And there's actually evidence that reincarnation was in the bible previously and was taken out yeah um, there is. i believe when the new testament was written so things have things are interesting about that but the fact that he was able to read people and reveal their past lives are in atlantis is very interesting i want to know where my past life was uh, i know i was told i was an egyptian man see what if i was an atlantean woman you might have been <laughs> we were together <laughs> maybe maybe for all we know, maybe you moved to Egypt. You met me. I was this goddess, <laughs> Bay, bodacious, <laughs> bodacious goddess. Atlantean woman. But essentially, the Atlantean's purpose was to usher in a new era of enlightened human consciousness. Casey referred to Atlantis no fewer than seven hundred times over a span of twenty years. That's crazy. And there is so much evidence really of his important. healings and the people that believe he healed him or uh, channeled energy or some type of entity and healed them. So if you give this guy any legitimacy, any credit, I think you got to take this account of Atlanta seriously to some extent. I got to take it seriously. Obviously, it's not. There's no physical proof, but, you know, still, still a good version of what could have been. So 
I don't know. I think you got to take it seriously. Now this, now we're going to go even farther out there and you're going to have to open your minds even more here because this is just an interesting, this could be completely made up fiction, but there's an author by the name Jane Egan who astral traveled to Atlantis. It's very interesting. And apparently this was also a Pleiadian colony, which the Pleiadians are a type of evolved humanoid race, extraterrestrial in a sense, type alien being mm. that may have lived here. So she believes that she had many astral projections where she visited this Pleiadian mothership. Well, first of all, if you don't know what astral projection is, do you know what, you know what astral projection is, right? Yeah. Basically, um, it's a belief that you can Basically, separate mental travel, separate your astral body from your physical body yeah. And leave it behind and travel anywhere into the universe yeah. on an essentially this astral plane where you can go anywhere, experience anything. So she believes she went to this Pleiadian mothership, which was 500 light years from planet Earth and a small cluster of seven stars located in the constellation of Taurus, the bull known as Pallades. The cluster is actually the eye of the bull in the constellation of Taurus. According to ancient legends, the stars are said to be the daughters and sisters of Atlas only six of 100 stars can be seen with the human eye. Now, the inhabitants of Pleiades, known as Pleiadians, are, like I said, a highly evolved uh, extraterrestrial race and the next step in our evolution. It is said that the Pleiadians are here to help us in our spiritual journey to enlightenment. Mm. So this is why they had the civilization here. And actually, Cherokee legend states that their people originated in the Pleiades uh, star system and they came to this world as star seeds of light and knowledge. Interesting. Isn't it? Very. I'm telling you the na uh, the Native Americans and oh yeah, like we've talked about before, the Aboriginals mm -hmm. talk about these types of star seeds and star mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. So if this legend was true, then modern day Cherokee Indians as well as other Native Americans could have Pleiadian descent. Pleiadians have kept a record of the complete history of Earth's human evolution from the very beginning to our present time. They claim the Earth is 626 billion years old. The Pleiadians are of a fifth dimensional frequency, which is one of love and creativity, a mm. goddess society, which worships family, children, and women. Mm. Makes Hell sense. Yeah, bitch. Makes sense, right? Oh, yeah. Sounds like a cool place. Fifth mm. dimension. So there's a bunch of dimensions that your consciousness can reach. We know this. And we are at a very low one. And these guys are a few above us. Mm -hmm. So they're not quite as fucking evil as we are. But she basically claims that the Pleiadian people were the creators of the city of Atlantis and they were extremely advanced species uh, from the universe, another place in the universe. Jane says that while she was astral traveling, she went aboard a white ship that had other people in it from Earth as well. It was very decorative and clean looking. She's, she then said that she started watching a projection of a beautiful city and a beautiful woman wearing all white. Mm. So obviously it's starting to sound like a like a movie a bit here, but yeah, I was going to say this sounds interesting. It's here. an interesting uh, story she's telling, but the woman welcomed her to Atlantis and basically told her that she was excited to show the people the future and how the civilization of Atlantis was planned by a hierarchy of the great ones. These great ones saw earth and how beautiful it was, but they also saw how us humans were acting like savages, killing each other and other animals and overall being fearful of the unknown. They decided that they're going to do to help these people because they were not capable of moving forward if they're going to continue to live like this. So in fact, these great ones had to take action and make a sacrifice by stepping down their vibrations so that they could tolerate Earth's atmosphere and lower vibrations. So it's this idea that is out there. Um, it's kind of ties into the ancient alien astronaut theory that in the beginning of, of human civilization, we did have help from extraterrestrial race of some sort. And when we talk about aliens, we could be talking just about another humanoid species that's just far more uh, spiritually, technologically advanced yeah. than we are, kind of helping us along, helping us evolve, uh, maybe even genetically creating becoming a us. part of us. Yeah, yeah, creating us in a way. So it's very interesting. And she went on to say that they're uh, the these aliens were essentially aware of the ma magnetic hues of the earth and were here to keep it together and stable. They used the magnetic fields to find a place that was so strong enough to where they could build a colony. That's interesting too. So the specific place that they chose to build was a place on earth that had vibrations crossing 
which meant that they were stronger and therefore had a higher vibration that would be healthy enough for these quote unquote great ones to survive and colonize. So they started colonizing at first. The humans were just, uh, they just saw this place as a bright light, but were actually afraid to come near it. So they kind of created this like, almost like, I don't know, like light city um, in this area at, that called Atlantis. So basically she goes on to talk about how, you know, they, t uh, she got a bunch of different information. She obviously figured out how they started there and it goes on and there's this elaborate, it's, you know, elaborate detail about how they created houses and kind of how they integrated. Um, but essentially the great ones gave the humans the idea to start writing books about the culture they lived in. So the people in the future would be able to understand what it was like back, uh, then. And she went on to say that Atlantis was situated between the old world and the new world. Hmm. So, and she goes on to describe what it looked like, and a lot of it lines up to the way that Plato described it with the the rings and such. Um, so, it's really interesting that, you know, this idea that it could have been a higher density civilization or extraterrestrial beings that were involved with this. And, you know, she talked about how they were really into the architecture. You know, my own whole thing with this idea of it being extraterrestrial is like, why can't we find anything from it though? You know, like if it was that advanced, there probably would still be stuff around. Right. right? So right. why isn't there anything around yeah. or that we can easily I find? I don't think it was extraterrestrial. So it's interesting though. And she also talked about how it was crystal energy that actually caused the havoc on the island before it was destroyed. So, huh. and that it was also the flood that wiped out. That was confirmed with her travels as well. So very similar to Edgar Casey. So again, it's like, you know, there's similarities between all the stories between Plato, Edgar Casey, and and Jane Egan. So I don't know. It's it's really interesting. I, I think that you kind of have to consider everything with Atlantis and can't really rule anything out per se because we just don't know, right? Yeah. Sorry, our family group chat's going a little crazy. I think something's going on with my grandpa. So. Oh really? Okay. I got a call. Let's wrap things up. But if you want to end, you can. But hopefully, you guys enjoyed this podcast about Atlantis. There's tons more out there, obviously. Yeah. There, you know, we just covered some of the main theories, main things out there about it. Will we ever find it? I don't know. I don't know. Do you think we'll find Atlantis one day? I mean, it's hard to say because like we're not gonna find it. It's not like we're all of a sudden gonna see a city. It's gonna be little parts and pieces sign, of yeah. it. And um it, it's not like we have any way to connect it back to Atlantis at the end of the day because historians don't even believe it's real. Right. So Yeah, and it, it may not be. It could have been a just a story to teach a lesson, you know, it could just could be a happen. fable. Yeah, I don't know. Who knows? But it's definitely interesting. There's so much more. Um, like Josh said, we could do probably a part two sometime. There's so much to it. And there's so many different locations and theories about it. And I mean, I think there is a good amount of evidence to suggest that there could have been this, you know, event that happened that wiped out a civilization that was extremely advanced, maybe even more advanced than we are. Because it would kind of help explain, you know, the other civilizations a bit more and provide us some more answers about the Egyptians, Sumerians, things like that. So I think there's a missing piece of our human history that we have yet to find. Definitely. And that's why we're on the hunt for it. That's why there's people out there researching this shit and trying to find anything that shows, you know, a different story from the one that, you know, we've yeah. been sort of told is the official yeah. <laughs> timeline of history at, you know, as far as we know. And obviously there's people's egos mixed up into it and agendas, mm -hmm. but I don't know. History is so interesting. I find it fascinating. Yeah, I do too. Especially when you think about something like Atlantis, like, or there being some, e you know, ETs or aliens involved with it or something. It's very, it's very fun to ponder. It is fun to ponder. So hopefully you guys enjoyed today's episode. If you did make sure you thumbs up the video, subscribe to us on iTunes and YouTube. We'd really appreciate it, but that will wrap it us up. <laughs> that will wrap that us will up. That will wrap us up. We're going to be wrapped up. We're going to wrap this shit up. But like thank burrito. you guys for listening. We hope you enjoyed it. As always, stay safe. And stay woke. See you next time. <laughs>